Golden Edge, presented by STN Sports Mobile from Station Casinos. All right, the Golden Edge podcast. Dave Shane Ben Goats hanging out with a nice president, Kerry Bubbles. So, Kerry, first of all, thanks so much for uh, coming down and spending some time with us. Ben, Dave, we're happy to be here and uh, ready to talk some hockey. So it's easy to get us here if we're going to talk hockey. So we're here. Looking forward to it. Yeah, awesome. Well, I mean, first of all, pretty easy question, but how's your, you know, off season been so far? Well, it's been fantastic. You know, obviously uh, it, it ended quicker than we had hoped in terms of the, the season itself. And so it feels like it's been forever, but it's it's been great. The business has been uh, fantastic. Uh, everything's coming together and we can't wait to get to September so we can get training camp opened up, get that first preseason game under our belt on September 15th, and then get ready to uh, take on those San, ha- San Jose Sharks on October 2nd. So everybody's fired up. So I kind of always think of you as like the George McPhee off the ice. I don't know if that's an accurate description. That That's kind of how I think of you. So maybe for a lot of the fans that are listening that don't really know what you do, how would you I guess, describe your role with the organization. Yeah, other than, you know, George and I are probably two totally opposite personalities. He's, uh, you know, a former player. He's very competitive. He's probably a lot smarter than I am. Um, but I, I really, I, I focus on the business side of what we do. Um, you know, we talk a lot about with our group, but our, our job is real simple. Um, it's to drive the revenues that are necessary to support what we want to do from a hockey perspective. It's to make sure that we have the best fan experience and home ice advantage in hockey so again so our players can do what they do at the highest level and then make sure that we give back and serve our community um, if, you know the golden knights wouldn't be the golden knights if it wasn't for the, the entire valley uh, the city of las vegas the city of henderson the way they support this team is amazing and uh, we never lose sight of it so I, like i said our business team it's real simple that's what we're here to do and if we do that at a high level then we're doing everything we can to make sure that the guys on the ice have the best opportunity to be successful, and, and that's what we're uh, focused on every single day. Mm-hmm. Before you got to the Knights organization, you, know, you worked for the Hurricanes. You worked for a group that worked with the Dallas Stars. Were you always a hockey fan? Uh, I was a hockey fan from uh, the earliest earliest period of time, as much as you can be growing up in Oklahoma. Uh, we had a Central Hockey League team, so I was uh, you know, fortunate. My dad allowed me to tag along many times. He'd take guests, customers, things like that to the games. Um, but I don't know that I really knew that I was that much of a hockey fan. I played baseball as a kid um, growing up, and, and so that was really kind of my first sport. Um, but I had a real uh, unique opportunity to work for the International Hockey League in Cleveland, Ohio. And I think at that point, that's really where I truly fell in love with the game and really started to understand what the game was about, uh, the players, the athleticism, the skill, the physicality, the hand-eye coordination. You know, a guy who played baseball, uh, I'm amazed at what these guys do. And, uh, and so that's really where I truly kind of fell in love with the game of hockey. And to be able to match it up with the sports side, uh, for me, is the perfect fit. Um, I had a great opportunity in Cleveland with the Cavaliers, but uh, the people that really knew me well knew that if the NHL ever came knocking, that uh, I probably wouldn't be there much longer. And so nobody was surprised when I told them I was leaving to go work in the National Hockey League. So you mentioned the Cavs. I want to actually ask about that just because, it, you know, for hockey and NBA, obviously, you know, the commissioner has a crossover, but there's usually not a lot of crossover with the two leagues. I guess, you know, my question first off is just kind of what you took from the NBA kind of coming into this, you know, um, maybe like game presentation, things like that, mm-hmm. um, you know, anything else, you know, obviously the, you know, financial side of things too, right. but but just what did, what were you able to kind of take from, from the success of the NBA and, and bring to the NHL, I guess, when you came here? Yeah, no, and I, I think first and foremost, if you were to look at the four or five major professional sports leagues that are out there, the two that are the most similar uh, are the NBA and the National Hockey League. Uh, the time of year, the number of games that are played, uh, the way local revenues really drive the business and how it connects to uh, to things like the salary cap, as an example, and and how these uh, businesses run from a financial perspective. Um, but I really believe the NBA is one of the best-run sports leagues in the world. Um, I really learned a lot. Uh, the way they take uh, the best practices in every discipline of the business. Uh, it's, it's done in a very, very high level and how they share that information. 
um, really makes uh, you know really makes for a great opportunity from a business perspective. And so being able to work in that league, uh, see excellence at every level, uh, and be able to bring that uh, to our organization. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, look, I'm not an expert in in many things, um, but I have seen excellence uh, in every uh, aspect of the business in terms of what it takes to be successful on the business side. And so to be able to apply that uh, to the Golden Knights organization, it served me well, and it's something that uh, you know we take a lot of pride in because uh, I really believe it's not just what happens on the ice that makes for a successful organization. I think it it starts both on the ice and off the ice. And that's why I think it's so important for uh, the business side to understand how they connect. Because, uh, you know, the players, they, they want to win. They want great cultures. They want a fun experience. Uh, they want a home ice advantage. Those things are important. And so when we talk about um, what the Golden Knights are and we start to think about our story as we look forward, um, you know, there's six, seven hundred other players out there that are future potential Golden Knights. And so what are we doing on the business side to help add to that story? So when George and Kelly McCrimmon and our owner, Bill Foley, uh, when they're out talking to these players, they're talking more than just about the things that would be uh, uh, just specific to the hockey side of our business. And, and again, I'm proud of that, that we're able to contribute in a small way. So Dan Gilbert's famous for his Comic Sans. <laughs> do you do your memos in Comic Sans? I, that, I do not do my memos in Comic Sans, but I did learn a lot from Dan about culture. Uh, about uh, establishing what your DNA is as a business and how you communicate that DNA. Uh, we have our own thing here called the Knights Code, and uh, a lot of what we wanted to do was just make sure that our business team understood, um, again, how we want to treat our customers, our stakeholders, uh, members of the media, uh, how we want to treat each other internally, and uh, really just providing kind of a roadmap, uh, but also utilizing some of the terminology of hockey. So we have our own Knights Code, and it's something that uh, I really learned from Dan Gilbert. Um, he, uh, he was really the master at uh, taking culture and what was important to him and then translating it to, you know, we had close to 30,000 employees within all of the Dan Gilbert family of companies when I left back in 2016. And so I was fortunate to see, uh, to see culture at a really high level. Now, I believe you were with Cleveland for like 13 years. Mm -hmm. Do you have any good LeBron stories in that time? Do I have any good LeBron stories? Uh, you know, there's probably a lot of them that, uh, that we probably wouldn't be comfortable talking about. But um, <laughs> one I like to share is just early on when you think about – uh, young people, um, and and it and it uh, and and it doesn't necessarily, um, uh, you know, at one point in time when he came to our organization, he was 18 years old. That's crazy. And so you know, you kind of get that in your mind. And so he's an 18 year old kid who obviously had a slightly different uh, experience in ninth and tenth and eleventh and twelfth grade than most kids, because uh, he, uh, as many people thought, you know, he was maybe the greatest. Um, uh, uh, you know, generational type player coming into the NBA since since probably uh, Magic Johnson or Larry Bird. Because uh, if you think about uh, Michael Jordan, he was a third round pick. So um, from early on, people knew that he was going to be a special player. But uh, we remember there was one point in time we were probably three or four months into the season, and uh, someone within our finance group had said, you know. Um, we've paid out a certain amount of money to LeBron, but none of the checks have been cashed. And we're like, well, okay, that's kind of weird. Maybe we should go ask him. And uh, turns out he still had all the checks just in his, you know, at this time there weren't direct deposits like there are today. It wasn't that long ago, but these were actual live checks. He didn't even think to like go take them to the bank. He just put them in his glove box. And so there were three or four months of NBA checks um, sitting in his glove box. And we're like, Le Le LeBron, you, you have to put those in the bank. You can't just put them in your... Um, and he's like, yeah, okay. You know, like he just didn't even cross his mind. And, but that's an 18 year old kid. Right. And, uh, that just wasn't his priority. And maybe, you know, maybe at the end of the day, it served him well. Um, uh, cause one thing that I do give LeBron a lot of credit for is he also, he always used to talk about, I want to keep the main thing, the main thing. And for him, the main thing was basketball. And, uh, I think if you look at his career, uh, whether you like LeBron or not, whether you respect his game or not. Um, what you can't argue is the consistency that he's had throughout the 15 plus years that he's been in the NBA. And I believe there's really very few players that can match his resume for consistency. And uh, I think that's what makes him one of the all time greats. Awesome. You guys have a number of new initiatives that have happened or you're going through. So I just want to kind of run through a few of them. Uh, first of all, you guys have updated city national arena a little bit. It's got a new look, some fresh paint, uh, 
how do you uh, think it's uh, looking right now? Well, we're, we're proud of it. I, you know, the honest answer is uh, when we first moved in in August of 2017, we had about a nine-month window to get the facility complete. Our first priority was to make sure the building was complete, that the NHL facilities were ready for our players to come in in September of that year. And so uh, what I would call the brand component um, you know, it was not a part of the mix. It was basically like buying a spec home with basic uh, khaki white, you know, khaki paint or white paint on the walls. And so it didn't, to me, feel like an NHL facility. A lot of the players, player areas didn't feel like an NHL player area. It was nice. It was fine. The carpet was clean, all that. Um, but it really didn't have the look and feel that we wanted. And so after we got through that first season, uh, we had a big vision for what we wanted it to be. We just didn't have the time to do it. And so immediately, actually even during the playoffs uh, that first season, um, we started with the player areas down in the locker rooms, down in the training areas, and uh, we started to put up a lot of the graphic vision that we had. And then after we got through that uh, uh, that season, in the off season, we started into the ranks, and so painting the walls black and and the the gold and uh, putting up the imagery, the logos, uh, the castle concept that we built with the video board on the NHL rink, hanging of the banners. Um, a lot of that investment really came in the second season, and honestly, it's still ongoing today. Um, as we're uh, continuing uh, with work with inside the venue, we've still got some more work on the non-NHL rink uh, that we're completing here in the near term. And uh, it's just kind of an ongoing thing to integrate uh, the, the brand and the experience that we've been able to create at the Fortress at T-Mobile Arena uh, and bring it to City National Arena. So I'm a Henderson resident, so I'll ask about that rink and just maybe the progress with that. And, and maybe more so is just kind of the vision with yes. that and, and what, what you kind of see that bringing, you know, to that area, obviously for the organization, for the city and, and beyond. Yeah, we're, we're very excited about Henderson. Uh, first and foremost, um, if you were to step back three or four years ago, even before uh, the, the franchise was granted, um, Bill Foley talked a lot about building the game of hockey in the market. And so we knew we were going to have uh, an initial uh, facility, but there was always a part of a vision to build facilities um, throughout the Valley area and, again, build the game. If you were to look at uh, youth hockey, even going back just three years ago, the number of kids at the U8 level, which is the first area or the first age level of recognized hockey under USA Hockey, uh, there were literally about 90 kids that were registered in the state of Nevada, and obviously uh, that game has changed dramatically. So the development of the game, especially at the youth level, is incredibly important. And so as we started that process with City National Arena, um, you have five sheets of ice in the market. Very, very quickly, we started to see that uh, we didn't have enough ice to develop the game the way we wanted, and we started a process. And I had a chance to meet Mayor March uh, about a year ago, and we started talking about Henderson. We knew it was an underserved market. Uh, we looked at the data at City National. About 30% of the kids that were in our uh, existing programs at City National were coming from Henderson. And when you think about um, you know, those, those parents and, and the travel time, again, it's fairly easy to get around the, the valley area, but still that's a 40 to 50 minute commute, uh, to come over. And, uh, we wanted to make sure that we could serve those great fans in Henderson. And so very, very excited to partner with the city of Henderson for a major development. It's 104,000 square feet. Uh, when it's all said and done, it'll be about a $25 million investment. And we'll put two NHL sheets of ice right on water street. And uh, what, what they, their vision for Water Street, and you're already seeing it start to come together, uh, we believe this will be a catalyst to more growth, and uh, that'll be our next step. And then once we get that open, which will be August from a year, uh, actually next August, um, all of the programming that you see at, at uh, City National, from Learn to Skate to our Learn to Play to our Little Nights to our House Leagues to the Junior Golden, all of that programming, Women's Learn to Play, Adult Learn to Play, Men's Leagues, all of it will happen at sitting at the the other facility in uh, in Henderson, and then we'll start to figure out where's the next stop. And uh, these have become integral businesses to the Golden Knights, and uh, and that's what we're going to do. It'll have full retail. It'll also have a McKinsey River, much like what we do. Uh, at City National Arena, and it'll allow us to, again, encourage fans to come to the McKenzie River in Henderson and uh, watch the Golden Knights when we're on the road or when we're at home. And 
Uh, it'll be a really uh, fun addition to what we're uh, what we're doing with the overall enterprise. Mm-hmm. Kind of sticking with youth hockey, are you surprised with how fast it's grown in this town? I mean, I'm sure you expected some growth, but are you surprised how fast it's kind of taken off here? Yeah, yeah we we are a little bit surprised. And, you know, these are all good problems to figure out. So if I sound like I'm complaining, um, just, just let me know. But um, the first year we had about 1,100 kids go through Learn to Skate. That's that first tier. You teach kids how to skate, and then once they learn how to skate, then you teach them how to play, and they start playing games. Quickly, we learned, because we had about 1,100 kids that first year, well, this second year, we had 4,400 kids. Ooh, now wow. we've got all these kids that are six, seven, eight years old. They want to take that next step. They want to learn to play, so you need ice. But once they learn to play, then they want to play games, right? Well, you need coaches, that not only know how to coach the game, but that are appropriately certified. You also need referees, right? So that's so huge. That, and that's important. They have to be certified. But it's not like, and this isn't being critical of baseball, but if you have good vision and you know the game of baseball and you learn the rules, you can be an umpire, right? You could be 14 years old and you can be an umpire. I was um, one at 14 years there old. There you go. See? Not a good one. Um, was one. Angel Hernandez comment here. I right, guess, as long as you put up ahead. with the parents and all that. But – the first fundamental thing about being a, a hockey official, you have to know how to skate. And so if you can't skate, then you're automatically eliminated from going through and becoming certified. And so um, we've got some work to do in those two areas. So maybe uh, as, as we're talking here, if there's anybody out there that has an interest in coaching the game or officiating the game, um, there could be an opportunity for you to reach out to the Golden Knights and, and let us know because we need to get you in one of our programs because uh, this thing is absolutely exploding. And, and it's uh, so it's again, it's a good problem to figure out, but it's one that maybe we didn't anticipate anticipate as fast as we should have and it was all of a sudden one day we're like holy cow we we need referees and we've got we actually have coaches from other teams refereeing games in their same age brackets well the parents don't love that because they think it's a conflict of interest they were flying <laughs> people in from LA and San Jose and Phoenix just to help with tournaments and and uh, so we've got to build some of that infrastructure here in the valley mm-hmm. well I want to I don't want to just stick to the Valley because you guys have gone international recently. You just had a little camp in Vienna, Austria. I mean, how did that go? Well, first of all, um, you know, if you think about our owner, Bill Foley, uh, from day one, he wasn't just thinking about Las Vegas. And I, you know, I have to give him a lot of credit. Uh, I can remember when we were going through the process with our, uh, with our TV uh, discussions for our rights holder, he kept saying, but where are we? We have an opportunity just beyond Nevada and uh, with our TV territory again, Utah, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana. And and so he kept pushing that that initiative and, you know, being the team of the Rockies or the Western Rockies. And then he once we kind of got that done, then then he started to say, well, how do we go more across North America? And, you know, so he's challenging us there. And then, of course, that next tier is how do we take this thing on an international basis? We're fortunate that Vegas is already a global brand. So how we attach the Golden Knights to that, I think makes it easier for us to take the brand uh, across the world. And then partnerships, strategic partnerships, like what we've been able to do with the Vienna Capitals. You know, it starts more on the hockey side, but now we've extended it to the business side. We had our team out there. Uh, uh, you know, we were able to capture some great content about what that relationship could be, some sharing of best practices on the business side, on the marketing side, and then, of course, on the hockey side. And then we'll look to incorporate uh, even just uh, corporate sponsors that sponsor that team. Could they potentially sponsor the Golden Knights? And so that's a part of it. And then we just kind of wrapped it all underneath an umbrella. As we uh, went into the playoffs during that first year, we started hearing from people literally all over the globe saying, I'm a Golden Knights fan. I saw what happened with that franchise, and we want to be a part of it. And so we started to create programming under uh, under the uh, the brand of VGK Worldwide, and it's been a lot of fun to work on, and we're going to keep uh, keep building this brand across, across the globe. I mean, I guess part of that building is the VGK road trip that you guys just – completed maybe touch on that a little bit and and i mean we've we've seen it over the years i guess kind of how it's grown and and seems like you guys just expand the footprint you know like you said be you know into the rockies and into those areas that you know maybe you're a little underserved i guess yeah yeah no absolutely and i I think it's important it's one thing to say that uh, the games are on in those markets and they are and uh, through our rights holder at AT at&t um, but I also think if you really want to build fans, you have to you have to take your product to those fans. And so for the third consecutive August, uh, we literally loaded up a bus. We had some of our marketing staff. We had some of our uh, PR folks. 
um, some of our players, some of our coaches, and we just took them to different markets that fit into our territory from Salt Lake to Reno to St. George to Billings to Idaho Fall. I mean, we were all over that territory, um, but that really is a part of it. And when I think about great regional brands. You know, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, they were so terrific at this. I can remember as a kid in high school going to camps and clinics that the St. Louis Cardinals were hosting. They had about 400 radio stations on their network throughout the entire uh, area and region. And so even at an early age, I got to see at a very high level, a brand like the St. Louis Cardinals become very, very regional. And if it wasn't for the Chicago Cubs, they may own the entire Midwest. Um, you know, you think about the Cubs and the Atlanta Braves yeah. and what they were able to do. I was going to say the Braves and yeah, the Superstation. And Superstation. Yeah. And so it, it does start with that distribution, um, but you have to go out and, and continue to build on those relationships. And when I think about, you know, again, brands that have really done this at a high level, um, those are three in particular that I think are really, uh, really terrific. Um, but the Cardinals really stood out for me. Mm-hmm. You guys also recently announced you're having a college hockey tournament here That's in right. January. Uh, you've got teams with two nights prospects on them. You got Jack Dugan at Providence and uh, Leighton Ahack from Ohio State. I apologize if I mispronounced your name, uh, Leighton. And uh, coincidentally, Army will right. also be there. Uh, shout out to yeah, obviously owner Bill Foley. Uh, how excited are you guys to have a different level of hockey at T-Mobile? Right yeah, now? no, it's it's fun for us. You know, I think for um, for the game itself, for building the game. Um, if there's collegiate hockey that's happening in the market, we need to be connected to it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this will be the first uh, Fortress Invitational. They have had college hockey at T-Mobile the last two years. Um, and we had just so many other priorities with our cur- core business that um, we just kind of sat on the sidelines, but we felt like it was time to get involved. And so the Fortress Invitational is here. Uh, we just put tickets on sale on Monday the uh, 12th. And uh, fans can, uh, excuse me, the tickets will actually go on sale on Monday the 19th, um, but fans can have the opportunity. So January 3rd, which is a Friday, uh, there'll be two games uh, on the 3rd that uh, that'll be terrific hockey that you basically get both games. It's not come to one game and then leave. Um, it's really, uh, if you buy the ticket for the game, you get uh, you get two games. It's it, They start at $30. And then on Saturday, January 4th, um, our team will play the defending Stanley Cup champions, as much as it pains me to say that, St. Louis Blues. Uh, we're going to play at 1 o'clock. And then the uh, consolation game and the championship game of the actual Fortress Invitational will take place on Saturday evening. And uh, same thing, fans will have the opportunity to really buy all three games. So you literally could come to the NHL game, uh, then leave, the, leave for a couple hours, get a bite to eat at some great restaurant along the Strip, and then come back for some great college hockey starting at uh, 5 o'clock on that Saturday. And uh, we're excited about it. Obviously, with Army, it's special because of our owner, Bill Foley, to have two of our prospects. Um, and then to have even just, you know, my, my daughter goes to Ohio State, so I'll plug Ohio State. But to have, uh, have the Buckeyes in the house, um, and it looks like about three of these teams are going to be in the top top 25 in the country so it's going to be very competitive hockey and we're going to add the the golden knights game night experience that fans have grown to love uh, as part of it and uh, so it'll have uh, it'll have a good feel to it and hopefully we can't um, you know build on something special and then who knows where it takes us down the road and i'm sure you guys are all well aware of the fact that the ncaa has changed some of their their uh, regulations which gives uh gives our market the opportunity at things maybe before we didn't have the opportunity with the new Allegiant Stadium and what that does for uh, college football, um, but also, uh, you know, whether it be the Frozen Four uh, or college wrestling. I mean, there's just a lot of great new opportunity that's happened uh, for our, our market, and uh, hopefully, mar- you know, facilities like T-Mobile can take advantage of it. Well, I know Ben's a Minnesota grad, and I went yep. to Wisconsin, so we're both college yep. hockey. Those big hockey Frozen programs. Four, bring it on. I know we're, we'll be right behind it. <laughs> Uh, you've touched on so many things. We've heard rumors of like a third jersey. What can you maybe tell us about that or just maybe any other uh, initiatives, you know, you guys are kind of working on going forward? Yeah, no, third third jerseys are important. Um, you know, as much as we love our home jersey and our, our, uh, our road jersey um, and the, the popularity of the sales for that have just been incredible. And again, we're so thankful uh, the way this market has supported the team. Um, we want to continue much like a lot of teams to evolve that. And our history is much shorter than theirs. Um, but we do think there's some unique opportunity to introduce a third jersey. So, um, you know, not saying exactly when we're going to be able to do this, but over the next uh, couple of years, we'll be introducing that third jersey. And then who knows what happens beyond that 
in terms of uh, adding other elements to the overall uniform design. Um, but much like all the other teams, it's an evolution. Um, we're real proud of our core uh, logo. We're proud of our secondary mark, but there's other things that, uh, that we think can fit into our brand on a complimentary basis, and we're going to look to introduce those to uh, Golden, Knight fa- Golden Knights fans along the way. Well, switching to like a different topic, uh, we know owner Bill Foley has expressed interest in potentially having an MLS team come play here in Las Vegas. Do you guys have any idea of where you might stack up in the potential expansion pecking order right now? You know, we're not exactly sure um, where we would stack up in terms of the the pecking order itself. I, I do know that we're confident um, in our uh, uh, in our group and how we could uh, impact. Uh, that league. And so uh, much like Bill had said, we're going through a process. We're continuing that process. Uh, we're probably not going to spend a lot of time kind of talking about it publicly because we, w- we want to lay the groundwork the right way. And then when we have uh, have our bid together, um, you know, we'll sit with the folks at Major League Soccer and we'll talk about why we believe we would be the right choice for an ownership group uh, in Las Vegas and uh, and see where it takes us. Uh, right now, I believe they have about 27 commitments. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's 24 teams, but there's three others that are coming online. And then there's a couple of other markets like Sacramento and St. Louis where they've, uh, uh, they've been pretty deep in their process. And, and so, uh, um, you know, but we're, we're in the mix. We know that. And uh, we're going to continue that effort. And once we have, um, you know, something that's more formal uh, to announce, we'll announce it. And then, uh, like I said, we'll talk with the folks at Major League Soccer and see where it takes us. But even even at that point, that doesn't guarantee uh, that Las Vegas would be selected. We just have to have to see where it goes. There's a lot of competition for Major League Soccer right now, and I give them a lot of credit. They've really built that league uh, at a very high level, and it's a terrific product that we think would be a real fine complement to the Golden Knights. Yeah, and you have competition, I mean, in market, too. There's right. billionaire Seth Klarman who's working with the city of Las Vegas right now on a potential stadium deal. You know, out of curiosity, are you guys talking at all between these bids? Is there a possibility that, you know, your two bids join to form one Las Vegas bid, or are you going to stay on separate tracks for now? Well, I think right now, um, you know, it would be difficult to kind of speculate on kind of where that would take us. I think the initial um, track would be that they were just different tracks. They had a vision for what... Uh, um, what their their bid would look like, and, and our our vision was slightly different. Um, but you never you never know down the road, kind of where it uh, where it evolves. Um, at the end of the day, whether it's our group um, or the uh, the Renaissance group, um, if it does happen and it's good for Las Vegas, then we're going to be supportive of it. So either way, um, you know, it's uh, it's not something that we're going to be. Um, you know, extremely disappointed for whatever reason it didn't come our way, but it still came to Las Vegas. That would be a good thing. So uh, we're all about growing this community. Um, we've we've talked a lot about the fact that we're already the entertainment capital of the world, but there's no reason why, as we continue to add sports more into our mix, that we can't be the sports and entertainment capital of the world. And, and we're going to be supporters of that initiative uh, with our brand and with our platform. We can uh, let you go on this. We appreciate your time. It's been great talking to you. Obviously, there's a uh, a date, a CBA date looming, you know, with the NHL, September 1, and their opt-out. Uh, I guess my question to you, knowing that, you know, obviously you can't say a whole lot, is from the Golden Knights perspective, how much concern would there be? You know, just over the three years, how much momentum you guys have built up, how much, you know, the city and, and excitement is, has grown to have maybe potentially just – or hit the brakes and you know and have to stop all that yeah and you know obviously we wouldn't be able to, to comment uh, in terms of uh, uh, the upcoming uh, time frame uh, what I can say is um, you know that that once that uh, time frame passes um, you know then there's going to be more clarity over the next couple of years um, you know I worked in the NBA we went through a process um, back in uh, 2011, 2012. And I think but personally what I learned is those things always take care of themselves. Um, you let the experts like Gary Bettman and our team, and then, of course, the, the folks on the Players Association, you let them do their thing together um, without without getting in the way of that process. And I think the more that, that teams individually comment about those things, it just, it just serves um, no purpose in the process. And at the end of the day, which I think everybody's aligned on. The game is growing. It's evolving. Uh, the players are making more money. The, re- the revenues are growing. The salary cap is growing. Those are all good things, and, uh, and, it, and it shouldn't uh, 
uh, you know, it shouldn't be easy for us to figure out how to align. Um, but like I said, it, the, these things take care of themselves. And so to answer the, your question, I haven't spent any time worrying about it um, because it's out of my control and it's not something uh, even having been in an actual lockout that, uh, that we spent a lot of time on. We just managed through it, and, uh, but they always take care of themselves, and then uh, you, know, you just go from there. So we're not, we're not too focused on it. Awesome. Well, Carrie, uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to chat with us. We really appreciate it. Good luck the rest of your off season. Ben, David, thank you. We appreciate everything uh, you guys do to cover the team. Um, it does matter, and uh, we don't take it uh, we don't take it for granted. Um, we've been around to a lot of different markets, and what you guys do to cover the Golden Knights uh, is really unprecedented and special, and we appreciate it. We appreciate you guys too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.